Hello. Thanks for coming. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> Thanks for coming to our Bloomberg Distinguished Professor talk. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kirby Dieter Decker today. Dr. Hello. Dieter, hello, this is Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Uh, he, uh, he comes from up, uh, from down the um, 95, 81, 81 from yeah, Virginia Tech, <laughs> where he is currently professor and director of developmental sciences in psychology at Virginia Tech. He uh, is a Virginia grown, mostly. Uh, person, although he grew up actually outside of Baltimore, and he received his BA in psychology from Penn State and his master's and PhD from UVA, also in psychology. He describes himself as an individual differences psychologist, which is a developmental psychologist, which is interesting because that is how I also describe mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. So, um, and his interest is in the development of individual differences in child and adolescence adaptive and maladaptive socio-emotional and cognitive developmental outcomes. Basically, what makes kids who they are, right? Um, this is not Dr. Kirby Dieters Deckard's first association with Hopkins, as he originally was an orderly across the street. Mm -hmm. That's true. Orderly or candy striper? Candy striper. Can so I thought candy stripers were women. They they, we did not wear skirts. Okay, <laughs> but did you wear did you wear stripes? No, no. We were okay. volunteers. It was actually a very rigorous volunteers program. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well. So, okay. It was so. fun. I wheeled around a lot of patients. That's okay. Mostly what I did. Well, good. Yeah. All righty. Okay. Yeah. So without further ado, Dr. Dieter Decker. Thanks, Janet. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to speak with you, and it's fun to be back. I grew up at, right on the Hartford County line, um, so for those of you who are familiar with the 95 toward Philly. That's my old stomping ground. Um, and today I just wanted to share with you some ideas that I have inspired in part by the ad for this fellowship program. Um, so the, especially the last third of the talk, I'm gonna reflect a little bit on some um, newer ideas I have about potential points of translation uh, for this um, developmental neurogenetics work. Um, I just want to introduce myself a bit more on the science side. <laughs> um, yes, I was a candy striper at one time, but <laughs> I, that's okay. That's, that's great. Uh, I've been doing some other things since then. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> um, we have a, a vibrant lab uh, called Open Lab. It's very collaborative, working with folks at tech and, and beyond, certainly. Uh, and we're driven by this seemingly simple and too broad question of what are the causes and consequences of human variation. I've always been fascinated by this question and I continue to be. Um, this reflects uh, a pretty accurate summary of the current breadth of the different types of developmental outcomes that we're interested in and the various aspects of the caregiving environment and the broader environment, a very strong emphasis on intergenerational transmission mechanisms um, and that's in part because of the emphasis on um, this long-standing interest that I've had in quantitative modeling. And um, I'll say a bit more today about that, but um, I'm going to speak mostly about the uh, behavioral and initial molecular genetics work that we've been doing. Um, takes a village, <laughs> right? And uh, I, I'm not going to get a chance to talk about the modeling today, but it really is a passion of mine and I didn't want to visit without saying something about it. Um, for years now, and most recently with Jungmin Kim Spoon, my colleague at Virginia Tech, um, we've been doing um, mostly structural equation modeling type approaches to solving basic problems in measurement and predictive modeling uh, within a developmental framework, typically correlational and sometimes quasi-experimental longitudinal designs. Um, applying this in um, behavioral genetics framework. This is a, just a tiny piece of a gene environment interaction model. This is Zoe Wong. She's now a postdoc at Ohio State. Uh, she was, some of you have had this experience, a PhD student comes in um, and she just blew my mind. <laughs> just the most brilliant person I've ever met and she just has this amazing capacity to, to uh, translate ideas into models and move from models back to ideas. Steve Petrill, who's a behavioral geneticist and developmental psychologist at uh, Ohio State, 
Dan Barry, who's now in the School of Education at the University of Illinois, um, who brought me into molecular genetics, and I've, I've learned a lot from them. My colleague at Virginia Tech, Martha Ann Bell, who is, uh, um, has always done work in psychophysiology, and she studies cognitive development in infancy and early childhood, and has taught me um, a lot about what I know with respect to um, EEG and ECG. And the latest addition to our, <laughs> our uh, village are folks that have been recently, well, it's been four years now, at our new research institute in Roanoke, which is about 50 minutes away from the Blacksburg campus, um, incorporating some neuroimaging techniques into the work we're doing. I've been hesitant, frankly, until very recently to incorporate these more direct measures of hemodynamics into our work because, um, as you'll see soon, um, the nugget of what we do um, has to do with looking at uh, intra-individual change and um, sometimes pretty small differences between family members. So a lot of what we do is within family work, and we need measures that are precise enough that we can capture those differences well. And um, we're now, I'm now convinced that um, a lot of the variables that we can get out of um, these more direct measures of hemodynamics um, in the nervous system can tell, us, can tell us something really useful. So today I want to focus on self-regulation as a foundation and a bridge between these two very basic and important components of, of um, health and human capital, and that is these uh, behavioral mental health outcomes that many of us are interested in and concerned about and educational and socioeconomic outcomes that many of us are interested and concerned about. Um, and so I'm going to focus briefly on this as a broad idea and then drill down here pretty quickly um, into executive function because this is something that Martha Ann Bell and before her Mary Rothbart, who was a mentor of mine at the University of Oregon where I was before I ended up at Virginia Tech, uh, have convinced me is, a, is an important proximal set of processes for a lot of the, the aspects of self-regulation that uh, my colleagues and I are interested in. So I'll start off just talking a little bit about executive function, or EF, and, and its um, connections to self-regulation and, and the outcomes that we care about. I'm not going to belabor that because I think this is kind of old news, we know, <laughs> but I want to I just make a few points about that. <clears throat> and then talk about um, some potential inferences that we can make about um, possible causes of human variation in executive function and self-regulation. And then s spend some time at the end talking about potential points of translation, as I see it um, um, recently. So um, like many others, most others, I think of self-regulation in this uh, very psychological way <laughs> and a psychophysiological way, because that's who I am and what I do. Um, so I think of this in terms of homeostasis and the modulation of cognition, emotion, and behavior. And whether that's done in a relatively effective and efficient way versus a, an inefficient and ineffective way. Um, it's critical to learning and health outcomes, broadly construed, and, and we've seen many uh, pockets of evidence across different aspects of executive function as well as executive function as a more general construct in terms of its importance. Uh, it involves these cognitive functions that are transmitted and develop through gene environment processes in these various types of contexts that we can think about. I've, um, and always will be, most interested in the proximal stuff that's going on between parents and kids. Um, I'm really interested in this social relationship, the social embeddedness of this transmission process. Um, the error that's not in here that will come in later is the impact that kids have on the self-regulation of their caregivers. That's hugely important, as it turns out. And thinking some about these contextual factors, too. Um, this is just a quick snapshot. I don't want to belabor this in the interest of time, but with David Bridget at Northern Illinois University, I couldn't find a good picture of him or I'd have it up here too, um, trying to think more broadly about the intergenerational transmission of self-regulation capacities, um, not just about executive function, but thinking about emotion regulation and um, um, physiological regulation and, and behavioral regulation and the various ways it's defined. Um, so wanting to just give um, um, proper notification or pointing you to a much more complex intergenerational transmission process that we're not just talking about passive genetic heritable things here. Um, and everything that's happening in that field is now moving toward um, much more, I don't want to say plastic, but dynamic processes, especially prenatally, um, with respect to prenatal programming effects, for instance. But thinking about um, the, the, the individual differences that stabilize early in development that capture different aspects of, of sort of um, stress reactivity 
and the interface with cortical regulation, especially frontal cortex, and um, looking at these different aspects of um, executive function being working memory, attentional control, and inhibitory control that I'm going to say a little bit more about here in terms of measurement. I'll return to this idea of struct measurement structures later. This is a really central piece of the work that we do, but we're basically talking about, um, <clears throat> in our work, Miyake's model of inhibiting, updating, and shifting, which basically corresponds to inhibitory control, a certain aspect of attentional control and working memory. And these are the types of tasks, the Stroop task, the Tower of Annoy. We call it the Tower of Annoy in our lab. Um, um, the you know, classic sort of backward digit and end back tasks and the Wisconsin card sort where you're doing dimensional um, card sorting looking for perseveration and these sorts of things that might tell you something about collectively and individually as tasks um, stable individual differences in these executive functions and there are, there are parallel or identical versions that can be used with kids as young as three with some trepidation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Pretty consistent findings with respect to associations. The vast majority of this work is correlational. A small part of the literature is quasi-experimental. Um, looking at connections between better executive function skills relating to um, stronger learning outcomes, better social emotional regulation and functioning, less psychopathology and aggression, and better physical health. So these are just some of the areas that I'm familiar with. Um, these are major reviews and sort of integrated theory papers cited here <coughs> that point us in this direction. This is something we've known about for a long time. The developmental um, literature is finally picking up on this in a, in a big way um, and really seeing executive function as being much more central to self-regulation, more broadly construed, than was true in the past. And that's part of the reason why we've been able to get funding recently, whereas in the past we had a harder time. So um, I won't pretend that we've been instrumental in that change, but it's, it's serendipity at least. Um, and these are just some um, examples of the data uh, published. These are from, uh, from our group looking at um, public data set, the NICHD study of early child care and youth development. We've worked a lot with that data set, with the um, public data set as well as a proprietary uh, genotyped data set. Um, and this just is, I show this to illustrate how early in development these connections are established um, just in behavioral data. So you see highlighted here this modest to approaching moderate, sometimes negative correlation between um, greater reactive anger and better sustained regulated attention, um, the effect size established already at the age of two. Um, these are multi-informant, uh, multi-method composite scores. We use, we use measurement modeling to derive these to get the, the best predictive validity out of them. And as early as four and a half years in the preschool, preschool period, um, this establishment of an association between academic achievement performance and executive function performance um, pretty early on that's stabilized already. So we're already seeing early in development the types of associations that you would expect um, based on the literature which is based almost entirely on adolescents and adults and some older sort of older middle childhood um, work too. So what's going on? Well I'm not going to say much about um, theory here because I want to get into some cool data and make sure I have enough time to talk about the contextual factors that matter for this stuff too because that's a real passion of me and my group but a um, couple of ideas here so for some of you you might be more in tune with the sort of the classic um, sort of uh, neurovisceral integration theory and poor just polyvagal theory and these um, various physiological theories about how it is that the cortex is involved in the neuromodulation of the, of the stress response. Um, that's attractive to me, but I'm also, um, I think a lot about social information processing. These are um, things that are in awareness and out of awareness that are involved in stress reactivity and regulation. Um, this idea of wait, then go, don't just react. Um, generate potential explanations, generate potential responses. Uh, this is heavily influenced by Ken Dodge's social information processing theory. And um, the, the point is that it's in the face of stressors and it's in the face of cognitive demands and challenges where you're really going to see the importance of these sorts of effects. So we shouldn't just be looking at zero order correlations, for instance. That's a, important, but we shouldn't stop there. We need to be looking at how it is that individual differences in um, these uh, executive functions moderate the connections between stressors and the variance in outcomes that we're looking at. So this is just a brief summary that um, 
I'm not going to read to you, um, but I want to move on quickly now into this um, looking at the causes of individual variation in executive function and self-regulation, where we're trying to be, we're really trying to begin to make some inferences that toward vertical integration across these different levels of analysis. So uh, I want to begin with just, um, and I'm not going to pretend for a moment that I'm a neurobiologist. I'm not. Um, this is just a, this is an NIH guide image that um, just um, tells you or reminds you of some in the cartoon some of the basic things that we know about in the mature brain, uh, human brain, the uh, dopamine and serotonin pathways, and a little bit of a prompt here with respect to um, these neuromodulators, these neurotransmitters, transmitters that are involved in um, certainly in basic functions as well as human variation in these executive functions. A dopamine is highlighted here because that's where we've, we've uh, focused our attention. I've been very much influenced by Mike Posner um, and Don Tucker at both at the University of Oregon in terms of thinking about attention as a, as a, and its correlated cognitive functions as a motivated behavior. And so we think about the connections through dopamine in terms of uh, motivation, uh, motivated behavior. Anyway, um, I'm far more interested in the population genetics and the, the modeling, and, and um, so this is from a recent review of some of the uh, most recent evidence in terms of replicated uh, potential candidate genes for various aspects of executive function, and um, the work that I'll present today is based only on dopamine receptor 4, uh, which has been implicated in prefrontal modulation of uh, dopamine levels, and there's a lot of debate <laughs> about what's actually happening there, um, and there's certainly a number of variants that one can look at. Uh, we've stayed pretty close to home base here and have focused on this wildly popular um, allele, this 48 base pair repeat sequence, and the seven repeat version of this um, has received a lot of attention, as many of you probably know. And we've, we've found some pretty cool stuff with it, so I'm going to share that with you today. Um, but before I get to that, I want to say a little bit more about development. Um, so these are just some ex example data and some images from Paul Thompson's group at UCLA, just making a couple of points. Um, the first is that we, for many aspects of executive function, um, these, uh, this first picture here doesn't show it because it starts at age five. This is age in years. but um, these just show this gradual um, improvement in working memory in this case. Um, we see similar sorts of things for inhibitory control. Attention um, is, is much more complicated, as it turns out. It's kind of interesting. Um, prior to age five, you see these really rapid increases. We know this. It's um, sort of the emergence of, of autonomy and self-control, for better or worse, as kids move from late infancy into toddlerhood. Um, that's where we really see these rapid increases from two to four years of age. Um, but we're also seeing people becoming more like who they were yesterday. So I like to describe it, the, this developmental increase in um, this actually, these are not means, these are uh, stability correlations, six month or one year stability correlations, showing that uh, the stability correlations um, increase and reach an adult-like level by the time kids are in uh, early adolescence or late middle childhood for these various aspects of executive function. And this just shows um, some images from, again, from this group at UCLA, uh, showing these maturational, um, some experience dependent, <laughs> um, shifts in, um, due to um, synaptic pruning and myelination um, that is certainly pertinent to some of these developmental shifts that we're seeing. Okay. So um, development is not only critical in terms of the way we think about these um, neurogenetic processes, but context is too. So this slide is action-packed, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on it. Um, highlighted in sort of a grayish pink here is to, to really make the point that we only see these effects if we look at them developmentally. So I, if you remember one thing <laughs> from being here for this hour, please remember that. This first slide shows some um, family member similarity data from a couple studies. So let me unpack it a little bit. This is uh, correlation effect size from 0 to 1. Um, this red dot shows our most recently published data. This is with Martha Ann Bell, showing that by age 4, moms and their 4-year-olds are correlated around 0.4 in their executive function task performance. Um, this shows um, 
older data, this is twin similarity in attention and inhibitory control based on parent report for monozygotic and same-sex dizygotic twins. And then these are data on a multi-informant, multi-method composite measure of sustained, well-regulated, attentive behavior. And this, these are actually cross-sectional data, all of these, um, and from four to seven, showing this dramatic increase in heritability if we make an, make an inference to, um, or if we make the assumption that we would see this longitudinally. And this is part of a broader story in developmental behavioral genetics, you may know, from many aspects of cognitive function, in fact, most, we see this developmental emergence of heritability. Um, so it, and it raises lots of interesting questions for me. It's like, okay, so you're telling me that genes don't explain any variance at age four? That doesn't make any sense. So it's kind of interesting to think contextually what's happening here in terms of demands on sustained attention. Kids are shifting to all-day school, and they're having to do all sorts of things that might be a fine, uh, a, f a more fine-grained context for looking at these developing differences in, in attention. Moving into molecular genetics, now we're looking at means here on standardized score of, um, I believe this is a, uh, these are composite measures of various informants, looking at um, those with one or two copies of the seven repeat allele on dopamine receptor four, um, showing this um, effect that others have found and some haven't on problems with attention. And this last slide showing our most recent work from the same sample, this again is the NICHD um, birth cohort study, this study of early childhood youth development, um, early child care and youth development, showing that this effect is in part due to an interaction between um, the genotype status on DRD4, dopamine receptor 4, and exposure to warm, sensitive caregiving from mom. This is an observational measure at age 3. And so you can see early on the differences are really small, and we see this emergence of this effect where only the, um, the individuals with this risk allele, if you will, and who also had low levels of maternal warm sensitive caregiving are showing these elevated um, problems in attention. The takeaway here is that um, context matters, development matters. Watch out if you're snapshotting this <laughs> or if you're trying to make broad generalizations about what dopamine receptor 4 is doing at any particular age if you're not carefully considering context. And I would say also we're learning a lot more about um, gene by gene interaction as well and the push now in candidate gene work is to consider um, systems of genes, so you, candidate genes. You wouldn't want to just look at DRD4, you'd want to look at a variety of variants within DRD4 as well as other um, dopamine genes um, to try and get a better sense of what's happening in this complex system. So speaking of context, um, we're really interested in relationships, and there's been a lot of work in the last um, decade especially. Allison Fleming has done really nice experimental studies with an using animal models. Claire Hughes has done really nice theoretical integration work and some um, naturalistic work. And um, uh, Susan Calkins at UNCG has, has done some really nice longitudinal studies as well, looking at the role of warm, sensitive caregiving on the development of these executive functions and other aspects of self-regulation. And for me, I've, I've had a long-standing long interest in the intergenerational transmission of stress reactivity and regulation. And um, the only book I've ever written uh, is called Parenting Stress. <laughs> and if you take the time to peek at it, you'll notice right away that the conceptualization is very much an intergenerational and dyadic perspective that um, my dissertation study was, was a sibling study showing that you, if you want to know how stressed a parent is, you better be asking them about a particular child in the family, because as soon as you have two, one stresses you out a lot more than the other. And there's, you know, at the time that I was doing that work, there was intense interest in sibling differentiation. And um, so, for instance, we can think about this in terms of the types of elicitors of, of a stress response in the caregiver. This person is an important and critical model and a provider of stress reduction for the less well-regulated child in terms of how they're reacting and regulating their own, um, you know, challenging emotions when these um, interactions get tough and these relationships get tough. And we're um, increasingly convinced that these aspects of cognitive self-regulation, which are involved, are, are being transmitted intergenerationally, of course, 
at the moment at any given time are critical to mitigating react harsh reactive negativity. So this has um, potential um, applications in terms of thinking about the etiology of harsh reactive parenting, risk for child abuse and maltreatment, and so forth, and also for the escalation um, and even promotion of these sort of uh, very challenging child behaviors and would apply in adolescents as well, and for dads too. I, we study moms for the most part for a variety of reasons, but we think it applies for dads too. Um, so let me um, unpack this. Uh, these data for you a little bit to show. Across several studies, uh, we have seen this association between, this is a regression coefficient or correlation, these are effect sizes essentially, the association between individual differences in problematic, challenging behavior in the kid and harsh negative behavior in the mom. And showing that that correlation, that association is attenuated if the mom has higher levels of working memory or executive function um, skills, capacities, depending on the study. We use working memory in, in a couple studies, executive function battery in another. Um, these two studies are actually sibling different studies where it's a quasi-experimental design where we actually are operationalizing um, reactive negativity by looking at um, sibling differences in challenging behavior and differences in the mom's negativity toward the two kids. So we can make stronger inferences about um, the mother's behavior being a response to as opposed to an eliciter or cause of um, the differences in the child's behavior. That's based on brief observations. Don't overgeneralize from that. The point is there's a dyadic process and um, the inference here with respect to the role of maternal cognitive regulation capacity and skills is that it plays a critical role in um, kind of mitigating or breaking this connection between challenging behavior in the kid and harsh reactive parenting in the caregiver. However, we've learned more recently um, that, and these bars here on the left show this effect again, um, that appears to get wiped out once you reach a certain level of chronic stressors. So we've looked at household chaos, self-report. In our current study, we're doing in-home observations as well as self-report to deepen that assessment. But you can see that this difference between these two subgroups, the, what I'll call for, in, for the sake of time, the, the poor, um, poorly regulated and the very well regulated mothers with respect to executive function, um, that, gets, that distinction gets wiped out. Um, and there, there aren't variance differences or big mean differences between these subgroups that would explain this. So we think it's getting at some kind of shift in, qual potentially qualitative shift in the process, the stress reactivity and regulation process. Um, in this latest case, this paper is under review, so take this with a grain of salt. We're seeing the very same pattern in um, our continuous EEG measure of, of frontal alpha asymmetry, um, which is a, uh, that's a very widely used um, measure of, some folks believe it captures traits, trait variants in negative and positive affectivity. Um, I'm certainly a believer that it, it's a pretty good, pretty good measure of, at least in the moment, um, mood. <laughs> and there's also a convincing argument that actually it's capturing motivational stance, approach and avoidance, um, which is you know, kind of intertwined with um, emotion and motivation, of course. Um, but that's been very interesting to see that consistently across the executive function performance measures as well as these uh, continuous EEG data. We'll see. The reviewers are having a field day. We resubmitted it, so we've, we've seen the reviews once, and they were interesting. <laughs> um, we'll see if we succeed. On these stressors, though, we've looked at chaos. We've looked at the number of, of socioeconomic stressors. I want to make one um, point about the broader context, and that is to think about the connection between some of these chronic stressors that we're interested in, um, single parenthood, um, the father and the mother having low levels of education, unstable housing, the father being unemployed, um, and this just shows the prevalence of these um, various combinations of risk factors within this particular sample in southwest Virginia, but we see this uh, pretty dramatic shift in the association, this is again an effect size, not a mean, scale um, in the association approaching negative 0.8 between individual differences in mother's executive function performance on our executive function battery and chaos in the home. And it's not until you reach this, um, this 
threshold, we haven't replicated this, we're trying in our new study to see if, it, if, it, um, if we see this again, um, where it's almost as if the chaos in the head um, matches up, corresponds to the chaos in the home environment. And I don't know if we'd see a similar story if we had chaos measures of the neighborhood, but um, that's something that we're very interested in exploring in the future. So that's, that's an important point about context that I wanted to, to mention as well. So in summary, before moving into um, some of the ideas that I have, and I'm really curious to hear your ideas and reactions to these too, so I want to make sure we spend time on them, um, is to um, just make the point about the, uh, in summation, about the importance of frontal and prefrontal cortex, dopamine and dopamine receptor 4, and its roles in different aspects of executive function, um, developmental increases in executive function levels and, and stability, and this developmental shift in gene environment interaction and thinking about the role of parenting, um, both in terms of the importance of the parent's own self-regulatory -regula capacity and the various s bits and pieces and stuff that's getting transmitted to the next generation embedded within that social relationship, as well as the role of the broader context that these stressors um, may really overwhelm the self-regulatory system. So the last bit of my talk, how do we improve uh, policies and practices using some of the knowledge that we can get from not just this work, but this kind of work. So I want to just say a few things about testing interventions, about improving assessment, and about building self-efficacy. Increasingly, I'm becoming a big believer in this process, not just for translation, but for improving the research that we do. So often, when we have an opportunity to participate in a professional development seminar or, or um, workshop, what we get told is that you know, we, we didn't measure what we should have been and, um, or we asked the wrong question. And some of, those, some of those inquiries are hard to figure out, but often they're really sound. And so I refer to this as reciprocal education and training of pre-professionals and researchers because for me, I really want to promote the idea um, that um, there's a lot to a lot of benefit to both parties when you think about the classic model of, of kind of didactic <laughs> dissemination of knowledge and how it's often done in these one-shot workshops, for instance. That's not how it should be. We should do a better job of reciprocity and really improving our science so that it, it does a better job of addressing real-world problems that professionals and pre-professionals bring to us. And of course, the, the research that really interests us and developing better applications so that we better understand how interventions, instruction, and treatment work. Um, so that's, as a backdrop, I want to launch into a couple of these points. Uh, the first has to do with differential response. This is part of what has drawn me in from the very beginning in terms of my interest in individual differences. Um, and I'll be honest with you, uh, Bob and I were talking earlier today about this. I've been puzzled at um, the almost single-minded focus on average effects in, in intervention science. And I know, I know that, that doesn't, that's not true for everyone. Um, but certainly in my own work and on grant review panels, um, it, I've, I've seen that. And where interest and concern about differential response comes into play typically is when there wasn't an average effect, when everyone was expecting there to be, and post hoc, typically post hoc. Folks are looking for uh, potential explanations of why it didn't work. <laughs> um, so really answering this, this question of which individuals improved, which ones didn't change, which ones maybe got worse in terms of iatrogenic effects, and why. Um, these just show some data that I'm very familiar with and comfortable in interpreting. The sure start intervention in Wales with the incredible years curriculum um, and the triple P an RCT in Australia. And these each show their percentages. They're showing, in this case, um, the percent change in variance for measures that showed the average intervention effect for the treatment and control groups, um, sometimes increasing in variance, sometimes decreasing in variance. And this showing um, the percent out of 16 outcomes at post-test that showed an increase versus a decrease in variance, again, as a measure of standard deviations. And the point I'm trying to make here is that, in my experience, um, even, often even when there's a fairly large average effect that's, expect, that's as expected, 
So it worked. Uh, we're not necessarily seeing shifts in the variance that are consistent with an interpretation that it worked for everybody. Um, and so some ideas in terms of neurogenetics that could be really informative here um, <clears throat> are that I think this kind of work can really inform knowing how to intervene at the right time and knowing where in the broader system it's most malleable. And so I'll use the example of primacy and recency of risk factors, this idea of critical and sensitive periods in development, for instance. Many theorists, <laughs> um, this is, you know, this is foundational in developmental science. Um, so we have key neurological factors that may be operating very differently at different points in development, okay? One of the things that we've seen a lot of lately, and I play with some gerontologists too, and there's intense interest right now in neurogenesis in old age. Um, and um, this was a paper that I stumbled on recently um, looking at, um, there's a lot of sort of theory integration and some, based on some good data from animal models here, um, but looking in this case at um, dendate gyrus uh, neurogenesis um, there, and a dramatic decrease um, beyond adolescence. So there's a lot of neurogenesis that does occur um, postnatally, but the vast majority of it is happening pretty early in development when you think about the lifespan. Um, if your intervention is hinging on neurogenesis as how it's going to work, we need to know that, and we need to know um, pretty precisely, I would argue, especially when we're trying to understand who it works for and who it doesn't at these specific times and points in development, this basic information about neurogenesis. And I would make a similar argument for systematic developmental shifts in epigenesis, so epigenetic changes at the genetic level. And in terms of where the system is most malleable, so uh, there's intense interest in this idea of general resilience, general plasticity at the genotypic and neurological level. So we might think about um, low levels of neurogenetic risk versus high levels of neurogenetic risk, this being informed by multi-risk models based on the neurobiology, neurochemistry, um, and other sorts of indicators we might use. And we might test competing theories about um, the interaction between um, the enrichment of an environment and this low versus high neurogenetic risk. Are we seeing this very clear differential plasticity where you have a subgroup that's showing both the best and the worst outcomes in the face of this enriched environment or the absence of it? Or are we seeing something more like a stress buffering process or a diathesis stress process, which I haven't really shown here? Um, and you know, I'm with these folks in, uh, who've promoted this idea that there's probably a lot to be gained from testing these as competing models and getting a better sense of how these systems might work in terms of where we can optimize the effects of interventions um, with respect to leveraging plasticity, where it's occurring in the system, both in terms of the environment within the skin as well as the environment outside of the skin. The second point, um, knowing when and with whom to intervene requires better assessment. And I'm, if I had a soapbox, I'd get on it right now, for better or worse. But um, I really think it's important for us to um, continually remind ourselves and each other not to pursue single indicator, gold standard type approaches to measurement because there's just too much evidence um, that it's in combination that these various indicators have their power. And these indicators typically are hierarchically organized and they follow pretty closely the hierarchical um, structure of the constructs that are correlated and related to one another. So the question is what combination of genetic, neuroimaging, physiological, behavioral indicators do we need to use to provide the most precise measurement of mediator and outcome, of timing effects, these sorts of things, instead of um, which biomarker should I use for this and which candidate gene should I use for that. Now we need, I'm, I don't want to, um, deride this too much, but if that's all we're doing, we're not going to succeed. The measurement's just not going to be precise enough. Part of what happens when you're doing this um, measurement modeling is it forces you to beat up our pet tasks and measures that we think are great 
and we discover a lot of the problems with them, and it's within this context of a broader measurement structure that we discover those problems and issues. So, for example, one of the things we'll be pursuing in the next decade is um, looking at the hierarchical structure of executive function and other types of um, constructs and classes of constructs where we're going from behavioral measures down into genotypic data. Um, these are ERP data, for instance. These are um, um, FNIRs, near infrared spectroscopy data, showing hemodynamic changes in the frontal lobe. And um, trying to figure out how we're going to incorporate these measures into hierarchical measurement structures so that we can be far more confident that when we're isolating variants for measurement purposes, we're really measuring what we think we are. Okay? It's a basic construct validation point, both, both with respect to convergent as well as discriminant validity <laughs> for so many of these tasks and, and the types of measures that come out of the neuroimaging and the genotype databases. The third point has to do with promoting knowledge of developmental neuroplasticity. And um, <clears throat> this is kind of the newest idea I have, which is silly because it's kind of the oldest idea in <laughs> developmental psychology. I should have thought about this sooner, but really promoting knowledge to build self-efficacy in recipients and deliverers of intervention, um, to learn how to apply plasticity as well as the limitations to plasticity by experiencing it. So using participatory neuroscience research and practice and professional development with all relevant audiences wherever we can uh, in, in, in a way to demystify um, these neuroimaging techniques and these genotyping techniques um, so that they become more accessible to everyone. So how does our brain and nervous system work? How does it help us learn and be healthy? And what can we do to help make it work better? Instead of um, this is, these are generalizations, but they're based on things we've all heard. Um, by the time I get to her, the cake is already baked, um, or the casserole is a favorite down in Southwest Virginia. <laughs> I've actually heard that one a lot. That casserole is already baked. Um, my dad was never around. I'm just like him. A lot of my problem is just what I was born with. Um, so really tackling these entity beliefs coming out of Carol Dweck's work is the terminology I like to use. These are data just, um, some of you will be familiar with these showing, these are just uh, naturalistic longitudinal data showing the impacts in middle school on math performance, or math grades I should say, on um, differentiating students who have um, what that group calls incremental versus entity beliefs about abilities and capacities. Um, incremental beliefs being that things can change, you can improve, <laughs> and entity beliefs being you know, it's in you, um, it's, it's, it's innate, it's a trait, it's whatever term you want to plug in there. And the reason I'm showing um, near-infrared spectroscopy equipment here, these are data from IAS et al., recently published study. I, found, I discovered this through some um, collaboration on an NSF center grant on unmanned um, aircraft, drones. That's what happens when you're at Virginia Tech. <laughs> That's where all the money is. <laughs> um, um, where they were really interested in incorporating um, real-time um, neuro information into, um, into the pilots on the ground or wherever they're located. Um, <clears throat> but the point here is that I want to make is, in very simple ways, you can demonstrate learning effects at the behavioral level as well as um, shifts in the hemodynamic response. Um, FNIRS compared to fMRI is relatively non-invasive. The head can move. You can do it in naturalistic settings. Um, it's not noisy. <laughs> you can do it with infants, little kids, too. And um, I, I am very excited about the idea of everyday neuroinformation, both in terms of uh, genotyping as well as um, FNIRs and EEG, out in the field, using it as part of what we do um, with respect to um, intervention and prevention work. And I think, while I think the focus should, should be in part on practicing self-regulation, and there's intense interest in this brain training, <laughs> um, I actually think we, we must also focus our attention on uh, education around avoiding the big impairers. We know about stress, but perhaps folks don't know as much as they should about the impact of fatigue, distraction, noise, and uppers, downers. Um, the, you know, coffee in the morning, coffee in the afternoon, nightcap, nightcap, nightcap um, cycle um, that we see a lot in parents of young kids, actually. <laughs> um, 
And certainly uh, coming back to this practicing idea, the executive function, self-regulation, practice, and training work from, from these folks, and the self-discipline and incremental or plasticity, plasticity mindset work coming from Dweck and um, some of Duckworth's earlier work, um, I think is, has real potential for when coupled with these, um, this demystifying and the use of these actual um, bits of equipment and technologies out there in schools, in clinics, um, wherever we're doing it, um, to just get folks comfortable with these ideas, to get more comfortable with the idea of this environment within the skin. We don't have to think of these as biologically determined and these as being contextually determined. And um, just getting everyone thinking more about this um, plasticity mindset idea and its limitations. I don't want to leave you with the impression that I believe it's super plastic, because we know that's not true. But um, we could do a lot of good. An example here is with our NSF-funded project, the Games Project, where we're developing some math games for middle schoolers with iPads in schools that have them. This is in Southside, Virginia, Dansville and Martinsville schools. Um, where we're doing instructional assessment and professional development activities there. Um, and we've developed Candy Span Game, which is one of our games. If you like these sort of um, types of games, you can go on iTunes. It's free. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's, it's a forward and backward uh, span game. where you, It's kind of like Simon. You remember the Simon game? Well, you go forward, and then you also go backwards. And we're using it as an assessment tool. Um, but we've developed, uh, we have a little YouTube clip for each game, we've developed narrated PowerPoints, and we've developed manualized instructional support for teachers to use. They've given us a lot of feedback about them. Um, in the interest of time, I won't tell you more about the math games, but we have, most of the work is actually on these math content games. Um, and these uh, executive function games that are coming are meant to supplement that for us to look at different aspects of executive function in the classroom. And next we'll the next step is to integrate dry electrode EEG and hopefully FNIRS as well um, into um, these types of projects as we try and move people along in terms of understanding um, the plasticity of these systems and responses to information from the outside into the inside. So just to uh, summarize, explaining differential response, improving measurement and promoting self-efficacy, these are uh, just three translation points that I've been thinking about a lot recently and inspired by this invitation to visit and I'd, I'd really be curious to hear what you think about those and other ideas you have. And just as prologue, if there's time, do I have time, have I gone? are we okay? Um, just to make a few comments about um, some of the potentials that I see here and what my approach would be um, if, I, if I were to be invited and was, were to come is to think about education outreach and research foundations. Um, for me, I really like the idea of um, the typical sorts of um, varieties of activities in, in education and training, um, perhaps developing whole courses, but more likely developing modules that could be used um, in teaching and co-teaching that emphasize developmental and quantitative emphases, um, and um, involving undergraduates as well, certainly. Um, outreach activities along the lines of what I was just describing participatory research and professional development activities, and really trying to, at the regional and national levels, building uh, networks to promote these activities, both through funded and then just, just in terms of professional service connections where we could maybe make some progress there. The Research Foundation um, is more of the, um, the more obvious stuff, I guess. Uh, really developing an interdisciplinary group uh, to look at developmental neurogenetics research of learning and mental and behavioral health processes. Um, and this is a picture of my current thinking about our work, a development of self-regulation research group, which exists in part already uh, at Virginia Tech and our group there, thinking about vertical integration across these different levels. Um, and in red here are our current, um, current grants that, that they're placed here in terms of where the predominant work is occurring in this hierarchical structure of, of uh, emphases certainly looking at development and um, looking at socialization and context um, as critical as well. With that, I will leave you with my gratitude for my uh, amazing collaborators and um, I'm ready to take your questions and comments. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Linda. That is really your identification of the multiple factors that are contributing to it. So we have uh, intergenerational considerations, uh, transgenerational uh, plasticity. Uh, we have uh, uh, all of the uh, issues that you've identified, critical periods. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then there's context and timing. And so you have these multiple factors operating in terms of the interrelationship and the interface of all of these and the expression of them. Uh, yet, timing considerations change and the um, context keeps changing. Right. So when, so when you're uh, considering an intervention, uh, you're at the nexus of multiple issues that are also changing over time right. uh, and the considerations associated therewith. How do you begin to target over specific age brackets, an intervention that would recognize the multiple factors that are operating. I'm asking this yep. respectfully because I, I, this is the way I conceptualize the issues, uh, but you don't know at what moment in time, uh, or let me say period, in, in the um, growth of the individual, both biologically, but also uh, um, intellectually and the varying context, how you're intervening to create and make about change right the theory of it. right no that's a great question and you know I think the the gold standard idea is critical periods because that that gold standard idea is based on this assumption that critical periods are universal critical periods are universal mm -hmm. and um, and then we deviate from that we have the more flexible sensitive period um, which builds in some <laughs> flexibility in these timing of these um, contextual factors that might come in and alter the development of that organism for its entire lifespan if they occur at a particular point or don't occur at a particular point. And none of the work that we've done um, can answer that question for you because um, although the, some of the contextual factors we look at, one could argue they're very stable, Empirically, the evidence for that is actually mixed at best. Um, so let's take the household chaos measure, for instance. Um, Ted Wax at Purdue, who developed that uh, questionnaire, and uh, Gary Evans at Cornell, um, they together um, published an edited book a few years ago on chaos and poverty and child development. And what's clear when you look over the sort of the corpus of that research is that the stability of the variation in chaos in, in homes and neighborhoods is, is low enough that there's plenty of change occurring. And I've heard in conversations yesterday and today with folks that um, there are serious challenges in doing high quality longitudinal studies. Forget quasi-experimental experimental designs even, just getting good high quality correlational longitudinal data because of transience of folks, people moving in and out of neighborhoods, people moving in and out of households. Um, so I don't have an answer for you based on our work. I would refer to the, the basic idea of a critical period as something that we would want to um, aspire to, but I, I'm just not sure that we're gonna get there in, in, in any time soon in the approach that we're taking. Um, now epigenetics, and there are folks in the room who are experts, I'm not, but that one of the things that excites me about epigenetics is thinking about those those epigenetic modifications might be more precise indicators of things that happened at a particular th time in development and particular things that happened at a particular time in development. So uh, I think there's some promise there um, in terms of the behavioral molecular genetics work that we're doing. But thank you. That's a, thank you. Thanks for that possibly hard question to start us with. Yeah. My pleasure.